Let's um, open the scriptures first of all uh, to Luke chapter 13. And uh, we'll just read <clears throat> verses 23 and 24. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? He said unto them, Oh, that's fantastic. Especially in the last days, you'll have this great revival of people be coming into the kingdom by the droves. Strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many I say unto you will seek to enter in and shall not be able. If we read it in Matthew 7, we don't have, you don't get the question there, are there few that be saved, which was why I wanted to read this one also. It's close to Luke 18. So turn right over to Luke 18. But if we read in Matthew 7, he says, Broad is the road that leads to destruction. Many there be that go in there. Straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leads to life. And few there be that find it. Luke 18 and 8. You know the verse, the second part of the verse. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith? on the earth. Doesn't sound like a great revival. Sounds like Jesus is even questioning, will there be anybody uh, that still believes uh, on the earth today? And now in the day in which we live, something new is happening. And that's what we want to move on into. The big cry today is unity. Uh, it's very significant. Uh, in Genesis 11, you read that God looked down, this is a tower of Babel, let us build us a city and a tower that will reach to heaven. The city is the civil government, the tower that reached to heaven is the, the religion of the day. So this is the first world religion, and it was united with the civil authority. And that's where we're heading. Babel, Babylon will be revived. Uh, Revelation 17 tells us that. But it's rather interesting that the cry of the whole world is unity. I remember an ad by Lockheed Aircraft Corporation in uh, Scientific American. And it had a picture of the Tower of Babel <laughs> in ruins, but the Tower of Babel. And here, this is what Lockheed said. We are undoing the Babel effect. They use those terms. We are going to unite the world with our computers. The whole world will speak one language. Well, you know, soon you pick up a phone and you talk in Afrikaans or English or, or, or whatever here. And in Japan, they hear you on the other end of the phone in Japanese. Uh, so you, you can talk to anybody anywhere in the world. We will all be speaking one, one language. They're going to unite the world. God said the imagination of man's heart is only evil continued. They can do whatever they imagine, and that's dangerous. Therefore, I'm going to scatter them and confound their languages. Everybody in the world says, no, what we need today is unity. <laughs> we need to be brought back together. God says, I've determined the bounds of their habitation. This is Paul in, in Acts 17 in his speech at uh, Mars Hill. I've determined the bounds of their habitation. I've separated them uh, that they might seek the Lord. But now we're going to get everybody back together. But now the church, that's the big cry in the church, is unity. Now you get a little bit discouraged uh, in Africa, I'm sure, when some of the Africans, the, the blacks, they profess faith in Christ and then seem to go back to their uh, occult practices. But this is nothing new, folks. <laughs> uh, it's been happening all down through history, and it was true of the Catholic Church. Everywhere the Catholic Church went, they absorbed uh, the, the religion, the occultism. But what is new now is... It is happening uh, in Christian churches. It's happening, there is an occult invasion of the church, and it is happening um, among those who call themselves evangelicals. Let me just quote one of my favorite authors, and probably one of yours as well, A.W. Tozer. Apropos to what we've been trying to talk about, he said, I took this off of a tape. I sometimes listen to tapes of, of Tozer's messages from the past. He said, I don't want God ever to have to say to me, I gave you your opportunity to tell the people and you didn't tell them. You wanted to be liked by the people and you wouldn't tell them. I'd lose every friend in Toronto. That's where he was pastoring at the time. 
I'd lose every friend in Toronto rather than hear it. I'd have you all turn your backs and walk away in cold anger from me rather than face up to that awful moment when the cry of men and women is heard, the summer is past and we are not saved, and I know that I didn't do my part to try to win men, to try to bring them to God. It isn't important that you like me, but it's tremendously important that you're washed in the blood of the Lamb, that you meet God in a saving encounter before that terrible day when you'll have to cry, the opportunity is over. And then he goes on, he says, there is a mamby-pamby, effeminate kind of Christianity nowadays that's telling the sinning world that they're not to be blamed, that it is a, it is a disease. We mentioned a little bit of that. That comes out of uh, psychology, you remember? Uh, and w so we won't go back over that. But Tozer goes on. He says, the modern gospel doesn't say too much about sin. It makes an awful lot about a whimpering savior who whimpers over people, excuses them, tells them, hush, hush, don't mention your sin. I died for you upon the tree. This is not the religion of the New Testament. It's not the religion of the prophets. It's not the religion of the church fathers and of the reformers. It's not the religion of the great missionaries. It's not the religion of the great evangelists. It's an effeminate, watered down, perfume kind of Christianity that parades a pathetic, bent over, bewhiskered Christ up and down in front of people who scorn him. You ought to know tonight, he's preaching to them now, sin is your own fault. And it's my own fault if I sin. It's not an excuse so I can say it was an accident or it's a disease or I got it from my grandfather Adam. I can't help myself. I'm a poor, weak man. He says it smacks, that teaching smacks of the dragon himself, a heartless betrayer of the sinner's trust. Remember, young man, the ones that lead you into sin can never lead you out. So there are a number of reasons why we find ourselves where we are today. We want to please men. We don't want to upset anyone. We have a mistaken idea that somehow we can revise the gospel or repackage it so that it will be acceptable to the world. We have people who, in their zeal to get the world to accept the gospel, have remanufactured a gospel acceptable to the world. And it won't save anybody. And that's part of, part of the problem. Now, the, so the apostasy goes back for 1,500 years. The Catholic Church has been an apostasy. Something new now. We are joining together uh, in, in this idea. Now, you think it's discouraging in South Africa? Well, go to Korea. Yangi Cho, past the largest church in the world. His church is still involved in, uh, you would find a mixture of ancestor worship there among those who call themselves Christians. Go up to his prayer, prayer mountain and so forth. You have, um, this is so built into the heart of man that it's very difficult to get it out. And we mentioned the other day, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, Paul says, You turn to God from idols to serve the living and the true God and to wait for a son from heaven. Something really happened to, in these people's lives. Why isn't it happening today? Because there is a false gospel uh, that is being preached. It's not being preached in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the convicting power um, of the Word of God. Now, we could give you a lot of, uh, a lot of examples, but... Why, why is this, and who are the people who are encouraging occultism? Well, let me, maybe I should explain occultism briefly. Occultism uh, is simply the, the, the belief in a power, some power that is innate in the universe. It's a potential, the human potential movement, the New Age movement is called the human potential movement. It's some kind of potential that we have in us. Uh, and it can be uh, activated by positive thinking or positive speaking. Uh, you know, Jesus was always so positive. He said, you whited sepulchers. Uh, 
He said, except you repent, you will perish. I guess Jeremiah was a po positive, you know. And when Jesus said, this temple, there won't be one stone left upon another, and Jerusalem will be destroyed, I guess it was his negative confession that caused it to happen. I mean, that's the idea that you get today. Don't say you're getting a cold, because if you do, you'll get a cold. Uh, but say, I don't have a cold. I don't have a cold, you know, and, and soon you won't have a cold, and you see the power of a positive confession. Um, so there are a number of people who brought this in into the church, into the evangelical church. Um, about 100 years ago, we had something called New Thought. New Thought, out of New Thought, came Christian science, religious science, science of mind, Unity School of Christianity, and, and so forth. Uh, new Thought was, was birthed, you could say, in Boston uh, at the Emerson School of Oratory. And there was a gentleman there named E.W. Kenyon who studied there. Uh, and he wrote some books. And Kenneth Hagin plagiarized his books. So, uh, I, I mean, this is all thoroughly documented. Uh, if you want to read my writings or the writings of some others. So that New Thought was retained. It was thrown out of the church and, and it became it birthed these cults, but there were some people who kept it alive within the church. Among them, Norman Vincent Peale and Robert Schuller, uh, his chief disciple. Robert Schuller says, no, uh, Norman Vincent Peale is my mentor. Now we have Norman Vincent Peale on national television, highly regarded. Well, Billy Graham praises him. Has praised, well, he's dead now. But Billy Graham said on national television, I know no one who has done more good for the cause of Christ in the kingdom of God than Ruth and Norman Peale. <laughs> but here's Norman Peale on national television. He says, you don't have to be born again. You've got your way to God. I've got my way. I found eternal peace in a Shinto shrine. Uh, let me just read you some of the things that Norman Vincent Peale has had to say. The world you live in is mental and not physical. Change your thought and you change everything. Your unconscious mind has a power that turns wishes into realities when the wishes are strong enough. Who is God? Some theological being? God is energy. That's the Star Wars force. As you breathe God in, as you visualize his energy, you will be re-energized. Prayer power is a manifestation of energy. Just as there exist scientific techniques for the release of atomic energy, so are there scientific procedures for the release of spiritual energy through the mechanism of prayer. Prayer is a procedure by which spiritual power flows from God, releases forces and energies, and, and, and so forth. That's not Bible, folks. That's occultism. Uh, so occultism says there's some power out there, and it works by law. Works two ways, by laws and by techniques. I don't know about here, but I, we were in Zimbabwe, and I, I mentioned just uh, was using dowsing as an illustration, and it really hit home. I didn't realize the man whose home we were staying in, they located his well by dowsing. It's called water water witching, water divining, absolutely forbidden. You know, you walk across the ground with a green willow twig. That's the way they did it in the United States in the early days. And that thing would go down like that, and supposedly the moisture in the twig was attracted to the moisture in the ground, and, and that was how you would locate it. But wait a minute. For a good dowser, that thing will go up and down like that, and it will tell you how deep you have to drill, how many feet if you're in America, or how many meters if you're in, in Europe. It will tell you how many gallons, or in your country, it will tell you how many liters per minute this well will produce. Furthermore, you can <laughs> douse over a map. They have to walk over the ground. So I don't know if you're aware of it, but Bermuda, the island of Bermuda, the groundwater geologist determined that there was no water. And in 1949, or was it 47? I've, I've got it quoted here in the book, but I'm not going to take time to look it up. Kennebunkport, Maine. Maybe you've heard that name because that's where some of our presidents have their summer residences and, and so forth. You would find a plaque in a room, and it would say, in this room, I think it's 1947 or 1949 anyway, and it names the man's name. He located, dowsing over a map, he located three well sites on the island of Bermuda, and that's where they drilled. 
and he even told them how much per, you know how many gallons per minute they would. Now look, information is being communicated, isn't it? There's information. There's no magnetic attraction. There's no scientific explanation. Somewhere, someone is is communicating information. And I could quote from all kinds of New Age uh, journals that will tell you, they will agree, that whether you're channeling Ramtha or you're channeling the Great White Brotherhood or you're channeling, you know, some spirit entity or whatever, the messages have a consistency all over the world. There is a commonality, a common denominator to these messages. And they're not just trying to help you find water. Uh, I could quote you some of the, uh, the people who have traveled around the world investigating this, and, and these are occultists themselves. These are not Christians. And they say, you know, we're getting in touch with some intelligence out there, and they're trying to teach us something. In fact, they're trying to teach us religious, <laughs> religious things. And in fact, they are. So these ideas, amazingly, there's, there's a power. And, uh, and it's not God. Because you don't, uh, you don't, well, first of all, God is not subject to laws. But these men teach that it's subject to laws. Uh, they will take, uh, you say, how can they justify this? They will take Hebrews 11, verse 3, for example. This is Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, Oral Roberts, all these men. Hebrews 11, verse 3 says, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So the things which are seen were not made of things that do appear and so forth. And they say, no, that's not what it says. What it says is, we understand that it was by faith that God framed the worlds. They Just by that little twist, you see what they've done. They've turned faith into a force. A force that God used to create the worlds. And because we're little gods, uh, and this faith, force called faith is contained in words, we can learn to speak these words forth, make a positive confession, and we can create things like God creates. So they would take you to Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, verse 6, verse 11, and so forth, where it says, about verse 3, God said, let there be light, and there was light. And they say, you see the power in words? So we can speak it for, no. There was light, not because God said let there be light, but because it was God who said let there be light. So then these people teach that we're little gods uh, and that we have this creative power, this force in our tongue uh, and, and so forth. And so this is one of the ways in which occultism is coming in to the church of Jesus Christ, even the, even the evan, evangelical church. Let me uh, give you some other, uh, well, first of all, before, while I've got my, my finger in the page here, Kenneth Hagin is generally credited as, with founding, you know, the so-called faith movement. Frederick K.C. Price, let me just quote you some of the leaders, says, quote, Kenneth Hagin has had the greatest influence upon my life of any living man. His books revolutionized and changed my life. Charles Capps uh, similarly says, quote, Brother Hagen was the greatest influence in my life. Uh, Kenneth Copeland credits Hagen's tapes with having revolutionized his ministry. But Hagen plagiarized E.W. Kenyon, who studied in Boston in that hotbed of the emerging New Thought movement. Here's Kenneth Hagen, Jr. He says, Somebody will argue, you're talking about positive thinking. That's right, he says. I'm acquainted with the greatest positive thinker who ever was, God. Come on. God is a positive thinker. Norman Vincent Peale says, positive thinking is just another word for faith. No. You can be an atheist and teach positive thinking seminars, right? So now... We're, we are, just what the Catholic Church did, we're dressing up occultism under a thin veneer of Christianese, Christian language. We're twisting the scriptures to justify uh, occult techniques that are being brought into the church. Robert Schuller says, 
the greatest power in the world is possibility thinking. Really, what happened to God? The greatest power in the world. See, here's how subtle it is. There are many Christians who think if they're praying for something, if I can just believe that what I'm praying for will happen, uh, if I can just believe it's going to happen, that that's faith. That's not faith. That's mind power. If things happen because you believe they will happen, you don't need God. What is faith? Jesus said, have faith in God. So faith is believing that God will make it happen. Well, then that changes everything. Maybe it's not God's will. Maybe it's not God's way. Maybe it's not God's time. But Kenneth Hagin says, Jesus appeared to him and gave him four principles, which if you follow these, you can always get what you want from God. And you will find that in his little booklet titled, How to Write Your Own Ticket with God. I don't want to write my own ticket with God. If I've got any sense, I realize God is smarter than I am, and he really loves me, so his way is best. I don't want to try to tell God what I want, but Yonggi Cho says he was praying for a bicycle, a desk, and a chair. Some of you have read his book, The Fourth Dimension. And Yonggi Cho says God spoke to him. Now, look, if he got a silly idea in his head, that's bad enough because it's contrary to the Bible, and he ought to check it out with the Bible. But when he says God spoke to him and he gives you the words, he is either lying or he was hallucinating or he really got a message from some spirit. And it's not the spirit of God. And he says God spoke to him and said, look, you're, you're praying for a bicycle. I mean, I don't know what bicycle you want. <laughs> there are French bicycles, there are American bicycles, there's speed bicycles, there's trail bicycles. I mean... Well, what, what, all different colors. You've got to visualize exactly the bicycle you want. And only then can I give it to you. This is God. So I've got to give my orders to God. And I've got to make it very clear. But what does Jesus say? Your heavenly Father knows what you have need of before you ask. So it's the difference between letting God give me what I need and demanding from him what I want, which may be the worst thing uh, that I could possibly get. So there are all kinds of techniques now. We're going to get a hold of this power, uh, and we're going to make it work. Now, if it works by laws or if it works by techniques, it's not of God. God is not subject to laws. But Yonggi Cho, in his first book that made him famous, it should have made him infamous, but it, that shows the lack of discernment in the church. Because, why do they have a lack of discernment? Because they're so eager for signs and wonders. They're so eager to get this power. And Yonggi Cho said, uh, a line is one-dimensional, a plane is two-dimensional, and that's valid. And he said the two includes the one. You draw enough lines infinitely close together, you, take it and you have a plane. And then he said a cube is three-dimensional. And following his analogy, he said the three includes the two. And that's true. You have enough planes infinitely close together. You have a cube. Then he takes a leap neither warranted by logic, science, nor the Bible. He says the fourth dimension is spirit. You've got no basis for putting spirit in a cause and effect dimensional relationship with this three-dimensional physical universe in which we operate, okay? There's no basis in science, logic, the Bi certainly not in the Bible. Having done that, following, well, he said he got it from the Holy Spirit, following his analogy then, he says the four includes the three. So now you see what we have. We have pantheism. God is spirit, but he includes everything. And so God creates out of himself, and the universe is part of God. He's created out of himself. That's why you don't use feminine language for God, because a woman gives birth out of herself. God creates out of nothing. He is not part of this universe, and that's why when this universe is going downhill, the second law of thermodynamics, uh, the law of entropy, energy is, is running out in this universe, and one day, uh, unless you know, God intervened, which he will, uh, the, the stars would be dead, infinitely dispersed, the whole thing approaching absolute uh, uh, zero. 
and all the corporate schemes and dreams and plans of mankind would be like sandcastles washed down into a cosmic ocean of nothingness. It would be like they had never been. And if the Star Wars force is the truth, then it's running down like a clock too because it's part of the universe. That's the difference between naturalism and supernaturalism. There are no miracles in Christian science. There are no miracles with the faith movement. It all works by laws. You understand? If it works by laws, it is not a miracle. In fact, the atheist would say to you, oh, you think that was a miracle just because you don't understand the laws that were governing. Your God is a hypothesis to explain the gaps in science. But one day when science explains everything, then we don't need your God. Okay, and if it all works by laws, and God has to follow these laws, and you know the laws, then you can do it, you can do it too, okay? So Yangi Cho said that the Holy Spirit taught him that we are fourth dimension beings, uh, uh, unsaved, occultists are fourth dimension beings, God is a fourth dimension being, uh, Satan and the demons and the angels are all fourth dimension beings. He says God revealed it to him when he asked them, how is it that the occultists, the Nichiren Shoshu, uh, the Soka Gakkai, they have a, a, a positive chant, but they get miracles. Nam Yoho Renga Kyo, Nam Yoho Renga Kyo. They say it over and over and over. And this creates miracles, supposedly. And he said, Yang Cho says to God, how come they're getting miracles and Christians aren't seeing miracles? This is what God told him. He says, the ungodly are simply developing God's laws of faith. Kenneth Hagin was told the same thing. You'll find it in his little booklet, Having Faith in Your Faith. And Kenneth Hagin says, repeat it, repeat it. He says, I know it sounds silly, but keep repeating it. You'll begin to believe it, and then it'll really work for you. Faith in my faith, faith in my faith, faith in my faith, faith in my faith. No. And Kenneth Hagin says, God told him that when he asked, how come I see these sinners getting miracles and my church members are missing out? And God told him the same thing he told, well, He's in touch with the same spirit that was talking to Yangi Cho, uh, that the sinners are simply developing God's laws of faith. So look, folks, you don't have to be a Christian. <laughs> you can play the dark side or the light side. It doesn't matter. I mean, do you have to be a Christian to flip the electric switch and get current flowing through here? It works by laws. This is science. Mary Baker Eddy thought it was a big thing when she turned Jesus into a scientist. Uh, so if it works by science, it works by, when I step into an airplane, um, and my wife and I fly too much, but I don't go into the cockpit and ask them, are you born again evangelical Christians, filled with the Spirit, and so forth. All I care is, are they good pilots? Uh, and you don't have to be a Christian to be a good pilot. Are you following me? So if it works by laws, and it is all built into this universe, you don't have to be a Christian. And that's why they say, well, occultists can do it. The Soka Gakkai uh, can do it. So now they're teaching some kind of a power that is not of God. It's a no more of God than divining with a divining rod um, uh, is of God. So this is part of the problem that we have uh, in the church today. Now, who else teaches this sort of thing? Well, we have something in, I don't know, is, is inner healing, is that come here at all? Inner healing. Well, the founder of inner healing was a woman named Agnes Sanford, and we talk a lot about her. I call her the Mary Baker Eddy of the charismatic movement. Uh, she is, it's incredible. Uh, she, she taught, let me just give you some of her teachings. Now, what I don't understand is, how can they read her writings, know what she teaches, and revere her? Uh, this is the founder of the Inner Healing Movement. We'll explain a little bit about it. She taught that the, uh, the, the Great Tribulation is past. We're in the millennium. Christians must, through science of mind techniques, take dominion over this earth, even removing the effects of the fall without the return of Christ. She's not looking forward to that. In the healing light, she presents a false God who she says is the life force in everyone and in everything, a form of energy like electricity. 
the original force we call God. I'm quoting her. We are part of God. He's in nature. He is nature. I was conscious of oneness with God and therefore with the snake. She's facing a snake now. How about that? Which God had made. She's, she's a pantheist. She loved Emmett Fox. Uh, he was uh, Charles Fillmore's, uh, the founder of Unity, uh, one of his spiritual children. Uh, she picked up ideas such as, listen, I'm quoting Agnes Sanford. This is the founder of Inner Healing. God's love was blacked out from man by negative thought vibrations. Jesus lowered his thought vibrations to the thought vibrations of humanity to accomplish the at one that's a unity term, that Fillmore called the reconciliation of man's mind with the divine mind through the superconsciousness of the Christ mind. She, she says, she gives four steps for tapping into this God force to turn it on. We simply say, listen, whoever you are, whatever you are, come into me now. Wow, what an invitation to demons. Uh, this is the founder uh, of of the inner healing movement. Uh, she taught that everything is a matter of thought vibrations. We can be made ill by negative vibrations. We can heal ourselves through positive vibrations. She writes, you might want to try this sometime. She says, you can project into the burglar's mind the love of God by seeing him as a child of God and asking God to bless him. So if somebody sticks you up or burgling your house, just project the love of God into them and call them a child of God. Just visualize them. As, as a child of God, and that's going to transform them. Well, she's honored by Yonggi Cho. She's honored by so many people. But the mate, one, the, uh, among the inner healers, uh, one of the major, major uh, couple, John and Paula Sanford. Have they been to South Africa? John and Paula Sanford, but certainly their writings have been here. Now listen to what they say. Miracles happen by the cooperation and union and interplay of spirit and matter. Confused men, that's like me. By the way, we expose it in our books. John Sanford claimed that Agnes Sanford was not a Christian and demon-possessed. When she started this school of prayer and where he studied, when she started this whole thing, and that he had led her to Christ and cast the demon out of her. Well, you want to read her, her writings. She tells she was raised in missionary parents in China. And there she sits before a Buddha and asking this spirit to come into her. So probably she was demon possessed. I don't know. But anyway, this is the woman uh, who founded this whole thing. And years later, after she's founded it and they're all following her, the leading uh, inner healers, he says, oh, I led her to Christ and I cast the demon out of her. Anyway, so here are the Sanfords saying, confused men have thought there had to be a violation of principles for miracles to happen. What rot and bunk. Miracles happen by releasing power within matter according to God's principles. Nature being filled, so, so miracles are natural. <laughs> if miracles are natural, they're not miracles. <laughs> you would be too bright to realize that. Nature being filled with the Spirit of God has immeasurable power locked within its tiniest cells. Miracles happen by the operation of the Holy Spirit within principles far beyond our ability to comprehend, but nonetheless scientific. I have sometimes been called a Christian scientist when lecturing on these subjects. Well, indeed, they are Christian scientists. Now, let me quote you what Pat Robertson uh, had to say uh, on this topic. I don't think we've quoted it. Pat Robertson said, I began to realize there are principles in the kingdom as valid for our lives as the laws of thermodynamics or the law of gravity. Uh, once we perceive this secret, we realize anew that the Bible is not an impractical book of theology, but rather a practical book of life containing a system of thought and conduct that will guarantee success. You got that? The Bible is not an impractical book of theology, folks, that tells us about God. It's a success manual. Amen. And it's got these techniques and these principles. And all you have, to, and even ungodly people can follow them. And God Himself has to follow them because they're built into the universe and He's part of it and so forth. I probably labored that uh, too much. But here's what we have happening Hagen and Copeland teach this, 
Cho teaches it. And it's, this is the foundation, if you're not aware of it, this is the foundation of the whole positive confession word faith movement. Okay? This is the foundation of it. Now, what, what else is going on? Something that surely in, in, um, in your country you could relate to. Well, we have Youth with a Mission, for example. Youth with a Mission, now there are uh, um, redeeming cultures. Um, so they're going to the South Pacific, uh, in, in our country, North American, Indian, witchcraft, in, Indian witchcraft. They're redeeming the culture. We have at the big gathering for promise keepers uh, in Washington, D.C., supposedly a million men there, one of the men that they had pray had the Indian uh, eagle feather yeah, headdress on that goes down the back and so forth. You know, when an Indian wears the eagle feathers, he becomes Wankantoka. He is the god. Uh, they worship the eagle. They worship uh, the, 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 the sun. They worship the, the, the waterfalls and the trees and, and so forth. But you see, this is their culture. So it, it can come into our schools. It's being taught to our, our children in public schools. Uh, it's acceptable because this is their culture and not religion. No, you cannot separate their religion from their culture. It is so closely bound together. It's rather interesting for us as Christians. A lot of people who call themselves Christians or Christianity is separated from their culture, isn't it? They go to church on Sunday morning, they sing some hymns, and they pray some prayers, but the rest of the week try to do business with them. Uh, they're pagans. Uh, and so, you know, I've done my duty Sunday morning. But the, but the Indians uh, and natives everywhere, I don't care whether they're native Africans or natives in the South Pacific, wherever they are, their culture is their religion. And so now, Youth with a Mission, we're going to sanctify their culture. We're going to keep their culture. But we're going to biblicize it and Christianize it and so forth. Why, the witch doctor, he's got some good principles, you know? And if we could just put some Christian terminology on, on this, uh, then, you know, look what we've done for these people. So we have all kinds of people who have been Christianized but are not Christians. Uh, they think that they're Christians. They fill our churches and, and they're being taught by the word faith teachers these un unbiblical uh, pagan principles. Well, I could give you a lot of other illustrations, but I brought a few things here that you might find inter interesting. I mentioned, I think, that the response to the seduction of Christianity was Oral Roberts. That was a book back there that we wrote, if you're not aware of it, in 1985. Oral Roberts immediately founded Charismatic Bible Ministries. And they agreed. But these are all the leaders of the Word Faith Movement. They all belong to it. And they agreed not to correct one another. See, don't tell me I'm wrong, and I won't tell you you're wrong. And I won't try to compare what you're saying with the Bible. But we're, that's one of their founding principles. We will not correct one another. That's one of the major problems in the church today. People are not willing to be corrected. They're, they're, we're not lovers of truth. Uh, and therefore, a strong delusion has come upon them. So here's an ad for their, uh, this was for one of their conferences. They have it every, uh, every uh, uh, once a year in June. And here's their... Here's their theme or their logo, uh, love and unity through signs and wonders. That's part of the problem today. People want signs and wonders so badly that they're willing to compromise the word of God. But you know the scriptures. You know what Jesus said. Matthew 24, 24. False prophets will arise and will do great signs and wonders so convincing that if possible, even the elect would be deceived. The Bible foretells a great signs and wonders movement in the last days. And it says it's not good, it's bad. Jesus himself said in Matthew 7, 22, 23, remember, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? In your name we cast out devils. In your name we did miracles. I will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. So Jesus is saying there's going to be a big movement. A lot of leaders, Christian leaders, 
They pass for Christians. They're doing it in his. These are not witch doctors. Look, I, let me just put it like this in as kindly a way as I can. If a witch doctor suddenly walked into our churches down the middle aisle, you know, and his, I don't know, all of his rig and so forth, whatever the witch doctor, the kind that he is, wears, we, we'd throw him out. Or we'd at least try to convert him. But when he walks in in a business suit or a clerical collar, and he's presenting the same stuff, but he's got it dressed up in Christian language, then most people don't recognize it. And then it leads them astray. And one of the reasons they don't recognize it is because it's so enticing. I can get this power. Uh, you can read about it. You want to read about that? We don't, again, we don't have time. Go to 2 Peter chapter 2. And he says, there will be false teachers, false prophets in the last days. And listen to these words. Who through covetousness shall make merchandise of you. They're out for money. That's all they want. But let me give you just a few false prophecies of Benny Hinn or Kenneth Copeland. Uh, these people are false prophets. Uh, for example, toward the end of 1975, now I'm going back in time so you can see that it wasn't fulfilled. Uh, Kenneth Copeland prophesied, quote, I'm quoting him, as you move into the month of January, that would have been 1976, you shall see more of the outpouring of God's glory than in the history of this world. Limbs that have been amputated, put back on by the power of God instantly. Bald men's hair growing to a full head of hair. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Eye eyeballs replaced where there were no eyeballs. God will cause your automobile that gets 10 miles to the gallon to get 70 miles to the gallon. The same car. Any, do, anybody remember any of these things happening? <laughs> nothing, nothing. He's a false prophet. I give you a lot of others, but we don't have time. Let's move on uh, to um, Benny Hinn. He's, he's the most popular televangelist today. Uh, not Sunday mornings, because I don't think he has a Sunday morning service. Robert Schuller is. Well, we, by the way, we offer a book in our ministry, and if you don't get our newsletter, you're welcome to sign up for it. It'll be sent out free. Uh, we offer a book called The Confusing World of Benny Hinn, and it will document everything thoroughly uh, for you, uh, but uh, I'm going back in December 31st, 1989, there in his church in Orlando. I think I mentioned this the other day, but I'll give you maybe a couple of others. Benny Hinn is right in the throne room of God. God is speaking through him. I, quote, I think I quoted it from memory, but let's get it exactly. The Lord also tells me about 94, 95, no later than that, God will destroy the homosexual community of America by fire. It didn't happen. I mean, you couldn't be too bright to make such a, a declaration, could you? They, they just get so filled with themselves uh, and, and, and filled with what they think is their power that they make rash uh, predictions and so forth, uh, but they attribute it to God. He said Canada will be visited the same night. Canada will be visited with a mighty revival that will start on the west coast of British Columbia in the next three years. It would have been by 1992. Never happened. He can't even take credit for the Toronto blessing because that was in the East, okay? Uh, Benny Hinn can't even get his testimony straight. Uh, in the PTL family devotional, I'm giving you the documentation, he says, quote, I got saved in Israel in 1968. In a 1983 message in St. Louis, he said, quote, it was in Canada that I was born again, right after 68. If you're a liar, you better have a better memory. You've got to remember what you said last time. Uh, yet in Good Morning Holy Spirit, that was a big seller across America, he says he was converted in 1972 during his senior year in high school. Major problem, he dropped out at the end of the 11th grade. He never was a senior in high school. Uh, I mean, the man, the man can't get his testimony straight and yet they follow him. And he says he goes to the grave of, of Catherine Kuhlman and Amy Semple McPherson where the Holy Ghost is lingering. And that's where he picks up this anointing uh, of the Holy Ghost. Well, th this, is, this is horrible stuff. Well, what is the result of what's going on? Well, Ray Comfort, I know if you know Ray Comfort, but he has said, uh, pointed out some statistics 
he quotes the statistics from a major denomination in the United States which said it had an incredible 294,784 decisions for Christ in 1990. We have people making decisions for Christ. I don't like that term. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't find it in the Bible. Decision? What, what kind of a decision? Yet in 1991, that's a year later, it could only find 14,337 of them in a Christian fellowship. 280,447 decisions that couldn't be accounted for. They just vanished. Uh, another U leading U.S. denomination in 1995, they, they claimed they got 384,057 decisions, but only 23,000 of them remained within the church uh, a year later. Uh, another crusade, 600 decisions were obtained with great rejoicing. Follow-up workers couldn't even find one. In 1991, Cleveland, Ohio, 400 decisions were obtained in an inner city outreach. Again, you couldn't find one uh, of them. Uh, Charles Hackett, the Division of the Home Missions National Director for the Assemblies of God in the U.S., he says, quote, a soul at the altar does not generate much excitement in some circles because we realize approximately 95 out of every 100 will not become integrated into the church. In fact, most of them won't even return for a second visit. So there's something wrong. We're trying by techniques and by persuasion, and we're repackaging Jesus and trying to make him enticing. Uh, Jesus, remember when somebody says, Lord, I'll come along and I want to be your followers. Remember what Jesus said. He said, Peter, sign him up quick. James, get him in the choir. John, make a deacon out of him. You know, we don't want to lose him. No, Jesus said, you sure you want to follow me? I don't even have anywhere to lay my head. And you want to know where I'm going? I'm heading for a hill outside Jerusalem called Calvary. And they're going to nail me to a cross. And if you want to follow me, make up your mind right now. Pick up your cross and follow me because that's exactly where we're going. You don't hear that today. And that's why we have all these false decisions. We've got all kinds of people uh, who claim to be uh, the, uh, I'm going to take about two more minutes here, who claim, and, and then we'll be finished with this, and I won't have to carry on tonight. They claim that oh, so, many, so many big revivals, I mean, there are, I, I remember um, uh, reading of, and I forget the man's name now, but he followed one of these big evangelists and healers through Africa, where thousands were being converted, thousands were being healed. And he followed it up. He couldn't find anybody. Uh, it's just exaggeration, and the, but they send these reports back in order to raise money uh, for, for, them, for themselves. That's a, a problem that weighs upon my heart heavily because the Word of God says, if you don't receive the love of the truth, they don't want truth. They want an experience. They don't want doctrine. They want some excitement. And those who refuse to receive the love of the truth will be given a strong delusion to believe the lie. And this is not pleasant to talk about, and we haven't even got to where I wanted to get, but I think you've kind of got a little bit of a background to understand what's happening and where we're going. And this is something new within the church. Occultism has been in the Catholic Church for 1,500 years, but now it's in the evangelical church. We're merging with the Catholics, and we're going, heading for a one-world church uh, very rapidly, and we, it could cost us something. We're going to have to stand firm for the truth and earnestly contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Father, thank you for your word that warns us of this time and help us to be true to it and true to you. And Lord, help us to rescue many. These dear people, there's so many of them who are sincere. They, they, they want more of you, but they've been led astray by false prophets. Lord, help us to help them, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Anyway, I am a practicing Catholic. Revelation 12.1, let's turn to it, refers to a woman with 12 stars around her head. Well, I have always understood this to refer to Mary, the mother of God. Please clarify this for me. Uh, actually, a number of the apparitions uh, of Mary, so-called apparitions of Mary, the Mary that appears, which I do not believe is the Mary of the Bible for a number of reasons, 
the Mary who appears claims to be the woman uh, right here. Uh, 12.1, there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. <clears throat> and so a number of the apparitions, Mary, the Mary that appears, appears in this manner and claims to be this woman. Uh, and uh, uh, it's a, it is commonly taught, in fact, it is practically Catholic doctrine, uh, that uh, this is Mary. Uh, well, what is the problem? There are a lot of problems with it. Um, even within Catholic dogma, there is a problem. Uh, we have the, in Catholicism, we have the teaching of the Immaculate Conception. That doesn't mean the virgin birth. That means Mary was immaculately conceived, okay, without sin and lived without sin. Now, if Mary could have been kept without sin, <clears throat> I think Adam and Eve were more immaculately conceived than Mary. Uh, they were created fresh from the hand of God. So if God could keep Mary without sin, why couldn't he keep Adam and Eve without sin? We wouldn't have had this whole mess. Uh, so it is absolutely contrary. And furthermore, the Bible says all have sinned. But anyway, uh, let's take what the Catholic says, that Mary is without sin. Now we've got a problem. Verse 2, she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. No, pain in childbirth is a result of sin. And if Mary, if this woman were without sin, then she wouldn't pain in childbirth. So you can't have it both ways as a Catholic. You can't say, this is Mary, but she's immaculately conceived and she's without sin. <clears throat> uh, so, but this is, is not Mary. Uh, there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. This is why some people think that a third of the angels <clears throat> followed Satan and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered to devour a child as soon as it was born. She brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days and so forth. Uh, that's the 1,260 days, is, which is part uh, of the, of the seventh, seven days week of, of, uh, of Daniel. Uh, this woman is Israel, and the Messiah is the child who was brought forth, who now has been caught up to heaven. Israel is still on this earth, and, uh, you know, and Satan is still out to destroy. If Satan could have destroyed Israel, there would be no Messiah. Uh, but uh, Mary isn't still on this earth and running off into the wilderness. And she never, never did she go off into the wilderness and so forth. So you just can't make this fit Mary at all. But it does fit Israel. Uh, uh, see, we have some real problems uh, with, uh, with apparitions, the so-called apparitions of Mary. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I've studied them in detail. Uh, let's take the apparition at Fatima, which would be one of the Our Lady of Fatima. Uh, and uh, that would be one of the most highly honored. Now, not every apparition is accepted by the Roman Catholic Church. It may surprise you, Medjugorje has not been accepted by the Roman Catholic Church. And I won't go into Medjugorje. Our Lady of Medjugorje says all religions are the same, all kinds of incredible things but has not been accepted. But Our Lady of Fatima is one of the major apparitions accepted by the church. Our Lady of Fatima, for example, said, um, many souls perish and go to hell because there's no one to make sacrifice for them. Well, what would you think of a statement like that? I thought Jesus Christ made the sacrifice. It says, Hebrews 10, by one sacrifice, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. And it's through the sacrifice of Christ that the penalty has been paid for our sins and the way has been opened and, and we have e eternal life as a free gift. So, but the lady, Our Lady of Fatima says, many souls perish and go to hell because there's no one to make sacrifice for them. So it, it is Catholic teaching that we must sacrifice ourselves uh, in, 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 and I could quote you from Vatican II and so forth. I don't want to go into too much detail. Along with Our Lady of Fatima, uh, on a couple of occasions appears a little Jesus about so high, fully on a cloud of light. And this little Jesus says, there will never be peace in this world uh, until 
This world has been dedicated to the immaculate heart of my mother in reparation for the sins committed against her. Well, that's not Jesus. Jesus was a mature man in his 30s when he died on the cross. He's in a resurrected, glorified body at the Father's right hand. He's not flitting about on the astral plane as a little child, a little baby uh, any, anymore. So this is clearly a demonic uh, apparition uh, <clears throat> to lead people astray. And unfortunately, the apparitions confirm an awful lot of Catholic doctrine, which would uh, give us some other problems for concern. Well, uh, Scientology, what is it? Well, <clears throat> in a nutshell, do you have Scientologists around here? Um, Scientology uh, was uh, started by Ron Hubbard, uh, who was a science fiction writer, and it's kind of a combination of science fiction and psychotherapy and Buddhism and Hinduism and so forth, Eastern mysticism. But to put it in a nutshell, Scientology says we are all uncreated, omniscient, omnipotent uh, beings called Thetans, T-H-E-T-A-N-S. Somebody says that's Satan with a lisp, so, uh, Thetans, and that's probably not too far from the truth. Uh, we created this M-E-S-T, matter, energy, space, time, continuum, in which our bodies function. We created little creatures and so forth. We became so intrigued with these little creatures that we incarnated them. And as they died and evolved, it's related to evolution, which is, as I said uh, yesterday, is related to uh, reincarnation uh, and evolution go together. But anyway, as they died and evolved higher, well, we reincarnated into them. And so finally, by the time they had reached the status of humans, we, who had incarnated them, re and re and reincarnated, were so far removed from our origin as Thetans that we forgot who we were. So the whole purpose of Scientology is they connect you up to what they call an e-meter, and you go through kind of a psychotherapeutic process, you go back, it's very closely related to Freudianism, <laughs> and you go back into prior lives, and you remove the traumas, the engrams that you've picked up in prior lives, and, and you, I mean, you go way back, way back, and way back, and finally, you reach clear. Uh, and you become a clear, they say, and you are really an operating Thetan now, and you are God. Uh, they, they don't act like God. Um, there's a lot of problems with, but you can see the relationship to Eastern mysticism and, and so forth. So that's basically uh, what, just as quickly as we can to be brief, what Scientology is. Question on keeping the Sabbath. If this applies to born-again believers, should it be a Saturday or a Sunday? Uh, there's another one that's related to it. Should born-again believers keep the feasts? Okay, let's go to Psalm 147. That's a question that comes up a lot. You know, on our mailing list in, uh, in the U.S., and I, I suppose all over the world, I, I don't know, but we have a, quite a number of Seventh-day Adventists, and they're always trying to, trying to um, convert me. Uh, you know, they tell a little story. You don't mind if I give you just a little bit of humor. This man came from way out in the country into Los Angeles. Los Angeles is even worse than, than uh, Joburg here, and he was just frightened by the traffic, and so he asked the man behind the desk in the hotel when it might be safe to go out uh, and walk the streets without getting run over. And the man behind the desk said, Sunday morning. He said all the Jews would be in Palm Springs, the Protestants would be in bed, and the Catholics would be at Mass, <laughs> and, and it would be safe. So Sunday morning, he looked out, didn't see any of any cars. He stepped off the curb and was struck down by a Seventh-day Adventist on his way to work. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the Seventh-day Adventists actually teach that the mark of the beast is Sunday keeping instead of the Sabbath. And that the church, that the, church the Catholic Church, changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. No, Saturday is the Sabbath. <laughs> we don't keep it <laughs> because we're not part of the old creation. The Sabbath is the seventh day when God rested from creating the old creation. 
we are in the new creation. <laughs> and Jesus rose from the dead on the eighth day, the first day of a new week, the firstborn of a new creation. And that is why we meet to remember Christ, uh, to worship him on the first day of the week, because the resurrection is the heart uh, of, of, of our faith. Now, the, the Sabbath was never for... Did we, did we turn to Psalm 147? Okay, verse 19. He showeth his word unto Jacob, his statutes and his judgments unto Israel. Now notice verse 20. He hath not dealt so with any nation, and as for his judgments, they have not known them. Praise ye the Lord. The law, the covenants that God made with Israel were not for any other people. Okay? Now go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. I think it's pretty clear there. Wherefore remember that ye, being in time past Gentiles, that's non-Jews, in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. So the law and the covenants and all this was for Israel. It was not for any other Gentile nation. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, that is, between Jew and Gentile. What was that? That was the law, the covenants. That's what separated us having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to making himself a twain, one new man, so making peace. So that goes to the second question, should born-again believers keep the feast? No. Uh, we have no reason to, to keep the feast. Now, if you're Jewish and a Christian, you can keep the Passover because it means something to you. I mean, your, your uh, forefathers were brought out of Egypt, and, and you would read that the uh, early apostles uh, kept uh, some of the feasts and so forth. But for Christians, it doesn't have any meaning. We have two ordinances, and that's all that we have, and that is baptism uh, and, and the Lord's Supper. But let's go to somebody still a little puzzled about this. So let's go to Romans chapter 2 and verse 14. For when the Gentiles which have not the law, that's pretty clear, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness in their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Now it's talking about the Ten Commandments. But there's one of the Ten Commandments <laughs> that is missing. Why do I say it's missing? Well, do you know of anybody who had imprinted in their conscience to keep the Sabbath? Nobody. Nobody. But they do have imprinted in their conscience not to lie, to steal, to kill, to love God, and so forth. The moral laws are imprinted in the conscience of everyone. Therefore, you can deal with them morally. But nobody has imprinted in their conscience to keep the Sabbath. Uh, I don't know of anybody. They wouldn't even know what the, what the Sabbath was. And so anyway, the, the Sabbath was not changed from Saturday to Sunday. The Sabbath is Saturday. We don't keep it because it was not for us. We remember Christ on the first day of the week. He rose from the dead on the first day of the week. He's the firstborn of a new creation. We don't keep the feasts. Um, uh, the, he nailed that, that law, to. although the feasts pointed forward to Christ. The old, we don't keep the feasts any more than we keep the Old Testament sacrifices. Uh, if you keep the feasts, you've got to keep the Old Testament sacrifices. Uh, and Paul says, he that is circumcised, that is, for religious reasons, is a debtor to do the whole law. You can't break up the law. You can't say, well, I'll just I'll, I'll, I'll honor certain feasts, you know. No, if you're going to come under it at all, you're going to come under all of it. Uh, and that was... Paul tells us the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. But now that we have Christ, we're no longer under the schoolmaster, okay? We actually have a higher law. 
the law of Christ. <laughs> and, uh, and we are not, if you're led of the Spirit, Galatians 5, you're not under the law. But we, it is now the life of Christ being lived through us. There is liberty, uh, not, the, not the legalism, but it is an high, even higher standard. You will love your neighbors yourself. You will love as I love you. You are to love others, Christ says. Anyway, that's too much time on one question. I'm sorry. My wife is shaking her finger at me. No, she doesn't. <laughs> okay. Here's another one. Christian authors and missions are speaking on behalf of Protestants asking forgiveness for the Crusades. They say every Christian alive at the time of the Crusades, uh, everyone were Roman Catholics. Surely there were some who were faithful to the Lord. Is this not just misinformation to make out the church uh, has always been one? Or, uh, uh, well, I'm not, I don't know whether you're aware of that. Uh, but this is a, rec a reconciliation movement that originated in the United States, I, I believe. And people, in fact, we had a woman on our mailing list uh, who had been a rather large donor. We never asked for a dime from anyone. And by the grace of God, he provides. And this woman had, in fact, uh, given some very large gifts. And then she got upset with us because we were not in favor of this reconciliation. We don't try to... to um, we don't change what we believe to, to encourage someone to give money to us. Uh, and if they don't uh, like what we, what we believe in our heart is the teaching of the Word of God, then, you know, uh, we trust the Lord. And, and they can give their money somewhere, somewhere else. Uh, there's some real problems uh, with this. First of all, the Crusaders were not Christians. Uh, they're waving the cross of Christ and they're slaughtering people in the name of Christ who said, my kingdom is not of this world and my servants don't fight. Uh, so obviously these people are not the followers of Jesus Christ. Uh, and they were slaughtering Jews uh, all across Europe on their way, the first crusade under Pope Urban II. Uh, one of the first things they did when they took Jerusalem, they herded all the Jews into the synagogue and set it ablaze. They went there not to take the Holy Land back for the people that God had given it to, his chosen people. They went there to kill God's chosen people and to take it for the church, okay? Because this is a Catholic doctrine that is being taught by a lot of charismatics today, kingdom dominion people, but the church is Israel now. And God is finished um, uh, with those people. So I have no reason to apologize to the Muslims today, which is what the, these people are mostly that they're apologizing to. I have no reason to apologize to the Muslims for what I didn't do, that Christians didn't do. They were not the followers of Christ. Furthermore, to be honest about this, why don't they confront the Muslims? The Muslims are, are slaughtering. Christians in the Sudan, for example, all over the world. It's a death penalty in Saudi Arabia for, for a, a Muslim to convert to Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, whatever. You have to be a Muslim to be a citizen of Saudi Arabia. You can't even carry a Bible on the street in Saudi Arabia. I mean, I could go on and on about the horror of what's happening. You can't even have a secret Bible class uh, in Saudi Arabia. And our boys shed their blood to protect them from Saddam Hussein, another Muslim. Uh, in the name of Allah, uh, who, who was there to, to, to take over. And you can't even have a Bible study on the property of the United States with the American flag flying over it in Saudi Arabia. I mean, I could go on and on, the PLO area and so forth. So instead of going back and pro, you know, apologizing for something they didn't do, and it certainly was not the followers of Christ who did it, I think they ought to rather confront the, the Muslims with what they're doing in Sudan. They're crucifying Christians. They're... they're, they're, they're uh, kidnapping. I mean, and again, we have a, I don't know about how much you know about it here, but quite a controversy in the United States because we have people well-intentioned and they're going to the Sudan and buying the slaves back on the slave market. And they're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy slaves back. And some people say, well, that's a good humanitarian thing. And others say, you're just encouraging them to, to take more slaves and, and put them on the market and raising the price and so forth. But anyway, this is what the Muslims are doing down there. And Islam 
teaches that they must take over the world with a sword. And Islam means submission. Islam was spread at the point of the sword, right? Everywhere they went. And yet we're going there and apologizing to the Muslims. Uh, now, were there other Christians? Of course there were other Christians. And we documented in the book of Women Rise of the Beast. There were millions of Christians who never gave allegiance to the Pope, and they were slaughtered by the Pope. The, uh, uh, there were more crusades that were fought against the Christians uh, in, in, in Europe. For example, the Albigensians at one time, the, the majority of the population in southern France were evangelical Christians. It was the most prosperous part of Europe. It took the popes about a century to wipe them out. Uh, pope Innocent III, for example, wiped out the entire city of Béziers, France, 60,000 people, including women and children. He called it the crowning achievement of his papacy. Uh, uh, so, yes, there were, there were always Christians who were never part of the Roman Catholic Church, never gave allegiance to the Pope. In fact, they called him the Antichrist, which I don't agree with. Uh, he's a close friend of the Antichrist, but the Antichrist hasn't, hasn't yet come yet. Uh, so it, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Of course, there were the Valdensians. Can I just tell you something else? I, 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 um, I was having lunch with a pastor in Pennsylvania, and uh, we were talking about this. And I, you know, Martin Luther said, "We are not the first. There are so many uh, before us." Most people think that it, this just began at the at, at the Protestant Reformation. These Christians, they were not Protestants. They were not protesting anything. They were never part of it. The Protestants had been Catholics who came out of the church and protested against the, the, the church and wanted it to change and get back to the Bible. These people were never Protestants. Uh, and I was talking about them, the Albigenses, the Valdenses in, in, in Italy and so forth, um, and, and the horror of this, the Qatari, and, and, and that for a, a thousand years before the Reformation, the popes had, had killed them by the millions. And he said, well, where would I find something like this? Well, I said, if you, if you look it up in the Encyclopedia, Britannica, Americana, whatever it is, you will only find the lies that the, the inquisitors, uh, uh, the lying accusations of the inquisitors, that the Albigenses were Manichaeans, that they were immoral, that they believed in ritual suicide, and on and on it goes. These are the false accusations of the inquisitors that they used to justify the slaughter of these people. And they somehow made it stick. Although we do have evidence, for example, uh, we have in the Bibliothèque Nationale de Paris, in the, 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 the um, National Library in Paris, we have the creed of the Albigensians that was read before the king of France. We have a letter from Cromwell protesting the murder of these evangelical Christians. We have a, a, a poem by Milton. I don't know, with your British heritage, would you remember Milton? Milton on his blindness. When I consider how my light is spent half my days in this dark world and why that with talent which is death to hide lodge with me, did you study that? Lodge with me useless and so forth. He wrote a poem in honor of these people. Uh, we have the uh, letters that the Albigensians themselves wrote uh, to the king of France protesting we are evangelicals. We believe in the creeds, you know, and so forth. And they're, they're telling lies against us. And, and, but, but you don't find it in the encyclopedias today. Well, he said, where would he find it? Well, I said, you might try Fox's Book of Martyrs. Well, he said, I don't have Fox's Book of Martyrs. Well, I said, you could try Halley's Pocket Bible Handbook. Oh, he said, I've got Halley's Pocket Bible Handbook. So, I don't know, is that anything that anybody would know here? Halley's ha Handbook? Some of you would have it. Uh, so he pulled that off the shelf, and he looked in the index. He said, there's no listing for Albigensians. There's no listing for Valdensians or Qatari. Oh, I said, I can explain that. You either have a 1962, 1964, or a 1969 Billy Graham Crusade Special Edition. Be and it's, indeed, it was a 1962 Billy Graham Crusade Special Edition because the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association received permission from the Halley family to make a special crusade edition of his pocket handbook, and they took out everything that Halley had so carefully researched 
of the evil of the popes, the slaughter of the evangelical Christian. You got to go to a lot of work to do that. You got to change every page number. You got to change every reference in, in the index and so forth. Anyway, I think that's wicked. Uh, and I don't think I should suppress the information. I think you ought to know it. Is there any value in psychology? Well, um, <laughs> oh my goodness, can you give me another hour? <laughs> no. uh, psychology, well, there might be some value in some forms of psychology. For example, um, uh, um, educational psychology, where they're studying learning problems of children, or industrial psychology, or what kind of um, lighting and sound should you have to make people more efficient and so forth. But uh, the psychology that touches most people is psychotherapy, and that's what's in the church. And I could quote you um, all kinds of secular psychologists and psychiatrists who not only say there is no value in it, but it is dangerous. And, and it is destructive. It's an invention, uh, modernly at least, of Freud and Carl Jung and Rogers, Maslow. I mean, these men that uh, that you would you would know their their names. I'm sure, even here in South Africa, uh, it is not of God. Uh, it is not biblical. Uh, and please don't turn Jesus into a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Uh, there is no such thing as Christian. We didn't talk about this at all yet. There is no such thing as Christian psychology. And you can verify that for yourself very simply. Go into any library, look it up in any textbook in the index. You will not find a listing for Christian psychology. You'll find a listing for, uh, for Freudian, Jungian, Rogerian, existential, humanistic, transpersonal, behavioristic. You'll find a listing for a couple of hundred psychologies about 10,000 therapies, but not a listing for Christian psychology, then what is Christian psychology? Well, there's no Christian who was the founder of a school of psychology known as Christian psychology. So what is Christian psychology? Well, it's an attempt to take the, the theories of these godless, anti-Christians, humanists, to, to a man and integrate it with, with the Bible. And th therefore, that says the Bible needs help. And, and if from godless people, it's the wisdom of the world that Paul said is foolishness with God, and they have uh, taken that and tried to integrate it with the Bible in order to uh, help the Bible. Now, this is the manufacturer's handbook. I think he pretty well knows what we, what we need. And if Christian psychology, just to be logical, if Christian psychology has anything of any value to offer, then the church was without it for 1,900 years. Somehow, through ignorance or oversight, the Holy Spirit left out of the Bible essential for dealing with people's personal problems. Uh, I don't believe that for a minute. Uh, and I, I, I like to be just a little bit facetious. You know, the Bible is all about people who had problems. They were hated and persecuted and, and so forth. Uh, let's take Joseph, for example. Uh, uh, Joseph was uh, his parents didn't like his dreams. His brothers hated him. They were going to kill him. They threw him in a pit. They sold him into Egypt, where he was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife of immorality. He ended up in prison, where he's languishing in prison. How is he possibly going to bear these burdens and survive? <laughs> Fortunately, there was a Christian psychological counseling center nearby, and they were able to come and hold his hand and build up his self-esteem and so forth. Otherwise, he would have never made it. No. If Joseph didn't need it, why do you need it today? Amen. Uh, read the list of the martyrs in Hebrews 11. My gracious, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins. They dwelt in dens and caves of the earth. They were tormented, afflicted, of whom the world is not worthy. And they triumphed through faith. Well then, I mean, read the sufferings of Paul and the burdens he bore. <laughs> and you think you got problems? Uh, and he triumphed through Christ. In fact, Christ... He said, when I am weak, then I am strong. Christ said, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. So, uh, well, I don't want to go into, into it in any greater detail, but uh, this is one of the greatest delusions that has overtaken the world and the church. And let me just quote Thomas Zaz. 
He's a, uh, one of the world's leading research psychiatrists, uh, not a Christian, he's a, a Jew, non-practicing Jew. Thomas Zaz, he has a right to talk about Freud the Jew, and he says, Freud's major motive in life was revenge against Christianity. So psychology is actually an anti-Christian religious cult. The whole purpose of it is to find a diagnosis. You got two problems <clears throat> that you have to deal with. The model of man, what is man, and the method of change. How are you going to change him if something goes wrong? And so psychology is an attempt to find a model of man without God, a purely humanistic, uh, behavioristic, although psychology has gone beyond behaviorism and transpersonal and so forth, uh, but a, 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 a godless model of man and a false gospel that tells you how to change him, uh, how to rescue him from, from his problems. Uh, so Thomas Zaz also said, do you want to know what we've done? Now, this is one of the world's leading, re, leading psychiatrists. Thomas Zaz says, you want to know what we've done? We have turned the salvation of sinful souls into the cure of sick minds. Okay, so here's a woman calls in on, on radio across America, a national broadcast, two uh, Christian psychiatrists are counseling. She calls in and she says, I just have a terrible problem with fornication. I go to bed with anybody and everybody. I just can't help myself. What am I going to do? The Christian psychiatrists say, well, you have an addiction. Uh, this is very serious. Obviously, your father was a milk toast and your mother was overbearing, and this goes back to your childhood. And it could take years of therapy uh, to deliver you from this. Where does it say that in the Bible? I mean, we got along a whole lot better without this therapy nonsense um, than we have since. It, it, gets, it gets worse and worse. I'll just give you one further quote. Some of you would maybe know the name um, J. Vernon McGee. Anybody know the name J. Vernon McGee? He would be one of the most highly honored uh, Bible teachers in America. Uh, he was the pastor of the Church of the Open Door in, in Los Angeles. Maybe some of you would have heard of that. But anyway, he's, he is on, he's, he's dead now, but he's still on the radio around the world. He takes you through the Bible, through the Bible with J. Vernon McGee. And I was having a, a, a lunch with J. Vernon McGee. Um, he was, he was elderly at that time, just a few months before he went to be with the Lord. By the way, in those days, he was passing out and he was recommending seduction of Christianity wherever he went. And he had just been removed. He ordinarily has the noon time slot uh, in all stations all across America. Uh, that's supposed to be the prime time. And he had just been removed by Moody Radio from his noon position to a less desirable time in order to put in his place Minnerth and Meyer, these were a couple of Christian psychiatrists who were teaching at Dallas Theological Seminary. This is what J. Vernon McGee said. He said, this is symptomatic of the decreasing biblical and increasing humanistic content we are getting from Christian radio and television and pulpits and Christian books and so forth. And then he said this, if this trend continues, Christian psychology will be the destruction of the evangelical church. Okay, take that from the most highly honored Bible teacher in America. As a young person, is there any modern music you can listen to other than the gospel music? I just kind of have to beg off on that one. I'm, uh, um, I'm not a musician. I don't know much about music. Um, but I think you could use a little common sense. Uh, for example, I think that any music that you couldn't listen to in the presence of God and that wouldn't glorify him, uh, I don't think you should listen to. Uh, what does it do to you? I don't know anything about music, but I know that there's some music that is rebellious uh, and there's other music that is soothing. I mean, they've even made experiments with it. <laughs> and, and, and plants wilt in the presence of rock music. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. They've done laboratory experiments on, on, on this. Um, I have some dear friends that they were rock musicians um, uh, and uh, in the secular world, top rock musicians. They became Christians, and then they got some kind of a Christian rock thing going, and they got me in free, of course, to the good front seat to one of their concerts, and I, I just didn't get it. <laughs> I, if there were good lyrics, I couldn't hear them. Uh, 
and it just uh, it just didn't seem like it was uplifting, and and um, uh, furthermore, um, the lifestyle of these people. I don't know about here, but in America, I can tell you, the lives they live are godless lives, and these are the Christian uh, leading uh, rock, uh, you know, music. I don't know. There's all kinds of, of music. So I think we ought to be very careful. What I would be concerned about is the so-called praise and worship that has come, and I, by the grace of God, we haven't had any of it here, um, but it has come in, it is sweeping America, and, and with worship, lead, worship teams and so forth, and I can tell you where it comes from. It comes from the vineyard. Uh, it comes from John Wimber. John Wimber was a rock musician, uh, and we have, in America, we have displaced the old hymns, and we now have shallow, repetitive, uh, we call it 7-Eleven songs, seven words repeated 11 times. Uh, we have 7-Eleven stores in America. I love to worship you, 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 I love to worship you. And I'm sitting there thinking, then why don't you worship him? <laughs> worship is not words about worship. So we're in love with love, we praise praise, and we worship worship, and Jesus isn't in it. Now, if you want to worship, let me give you a song. Well, let's take uh, Charles Wesley. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain, for me who him to death pursued. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Amen. Now you're worshiping. you got content, but they've taken away these, these hymns that have content and they've got some doctrinally unsound stuff, but it's generally it's shallow and it's repetitive. Anyway, I got that little word in there. <laughs> um, not all speaking in tongues is wrong. Does this mean that the gift is still in use today? If so, where, how could you give scriptures? Well, I do not believe that the gifts of the Spirit have passed away. I believe that God is the same today uh, as, as he ever was. On the other hand, I would have to say that, I don't know what percentage I would put on it, uh, but certainly whatever I see on television, this is not the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, why aren't they in operation today? Well, people ask about slaying in the Spirit, for example. The only slaying in the Spirit that I know of is Ananias and Sapphira, uh, and, and they were killed. Uh, there's a lot of problems with the slaying in the, in, in the Spirit, uh, and, and this is part of the t tongues movement. Uh, when Jesus said, I am, in the garden, they fell backwards. That's an indication of judgment. When, when you are a believer, you fall on your face. So why do these people all fall backwards? Uh, and I don't find any of this being taught in, in, in the Bible. Uh, now, speaking in tongues, this, it's known as a tongues movement. And I may offend some of you, but you have to go to the scriptures and check it out for yourself. I think it's an important topic. I believe that speaking in tongues is the most dangerous of all the gifts. Why do I say that? Because it's the easiest to simulate. You can't fool people into thinking you're raising the dead, but you could fool yourself and others into thinking you're speaking in tongues. Therefore, you better handle it with more care. So you have somebody, but it's handled with the least care. And everybody's got to do this. So you lay hands on somebody and blah, 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 you know, and, and just uh, let it go, brother, and, and, and repeat after me. And you say, blah, 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 blah. you got it, brother. You got it, sister. Go home and practice your prayer language. Well, you might as well go home and practice walking on water. You don't get a gift from God by practicing it. So now one of the major problems is then that they think that this is something they can practice and that they can do whenever they want to do it. Again, now some of you are not going to agree with this, but I'm telling you what I believe in my conviction from the scripture. You can't raise the dead anytime you want. You can't prophesy anytime you want. I don't think. You can't heal the sick anytime you want. You know, I've laid hands on the sick and I've seen them healed instantly on a few occasions. I had, that was the gift of healing at that time. Doesn't mean I possess the gift of healing. Then I can go, that was God manifested that gift as he saw fit at the time. But now I don't possess it and I can't run around and, and heal anytime I want. So why isn't it the same with tongues? I believe it is. I don't believe that there's any indication that tongues is a different. Therefore, but there are people who think they've got this now and they can just, I was gonna say motor mouth, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. They, were just, they can just turn this on 
And they can do it, and you've got to be talking in tongues all the time and so forth. Could be a great delusion. Now, I believe that Paul explains that this is not the way it is. <laughs> you remember Paul said, I thank God, this is 1 Corinthians 14, you would know the verse, I thank, well, he said, now, the anti-tongues people misquote the scripture where, where Paul says, uh, in the church, I, you know, I'd rather speak five words of my understanding than 10,000 unknown tongues, but they leave out in the church. <laughs> and they just say, I'd rather speak five words of my understanding than 10,000 tongues. It's not what Paul says. Um, Paul says that he, he's being edified. By the way, there's a difference between the tongues on the day of Pentecost and, and, the, and the tongues in 1 Corinthians. On the day of Pentecost, you didn't need an interpreter, right? There was no interpreter. Everybody heard them in his own language. The miracle might have been in, in, in their ears. I, I don't know. But now Paul says there should only be one and a, or two at the most. Or is it two or three at the most? Uh, one at a time and not without an interpreter. Now, you have people violating that. Everybody is supposedly speaking in tongues or singing in tongues together. We had them on, on television. You got Kenneth Hagin and, and, and Fred Price and I don't know who else, some of these guys, Kenneth Copeland, and they're just carrying on for 45 minutes on national television, supposedly talking in tongues, I guess telling jokes to one another in tongues, laughing uproariously and so forth. That's not biblical. Now, if you don't follow what the Bible says about tongues, and the, and the regulations that are put upon it, why should I believe that you've got the gift of tongues that, that the Bible talks about? I think it's that simple. But anyway, Paul said, I thank God I speak with tongues more than you all. Is that right? Isn't that what Paul said? Now, how could he possibly say that? He's a very busy man. He's out debating uh, in the marketplace, uh, counseling with people and preaching. Some lady sitting at home spinning thread all day, she could talk in tongues a whole lot more than Paul. So how can Paul say, I thank God I speak with tongues more than you all? Hey, maybe there wasn't so much tongues going on in 1 Corinthians as people think there was, huh? But Paul rebukes him. He says, every one of you has a tongue and so forth. And yet at the same time, he says, I speak in tongues more than you all. Maybe they that wasn't uh, the, the real thing. Maybe it wasn't really the Spirit of God. So if the Spirit of God comes upon you and you raise the dead or you, you, you prophesy or whatever, I have no quarrel with it. The Spirit of God comes upon you, you speak in tongues, and he has his purpose. This manifestation is given for the edifying of the body of Christ. I have no quarrel with it. But if this is something that you think that you've, you've learned now and you've got a handle on it and you can do it anytime you want, I think that's a problem. Well, we've got probably two more, too, too many more, to get to them. So I can carry on, but you tell me. If you want to leave, you can leave. Let's try another one. The Almighty Father gave us his only begotten Son to die for us and save us from our sins. Begotten. Woo! Boy, we got some tough ones. Um, I don't know. Um, the, um, the Jesus, the Son, is co-equal, co-existent, co-eternal with his Father. I don't believe that there was ever, uh, there's no beginning. He's without beginning, without end. He says, I'm the first and I'm the last, doesn't he? So I don't think that he could have been begotten in eternity. Um, and it does say, this day have I begotten thee, Psalm 2. So um, I think that it must be, it ha must have to do with his being begotten into this world uh, through, through the virgin birth. Uh, that would be the only explanation. Yeah.